We gather with gratitude this morning on traditional Cree lands that are now part of Treaty 6 territory and shared by many nations. A reading with a little bit of a history lesson. In 1961, the Unitarians and Universalists merged to form the Unitarian Universalist Association, a religion that emphasizes the love and acceptance of all people. Unitarian religious beliefs are not a fixed set of answers for big religious questions in life that you must accept in order to belong. Unitarian Universalists instead believe that religion is an ongoing quest to discover what is deepest and most true. We may come from a liberal Christian tradition, but we believe that, believe that truth is found in many sources, not only the Bible, but also the holy books of the various religious traditions, from the Quran to the Tao Te Ching, as you can see in the banners of different world religions posted around our church. We also find religious truth in poetry and music, in the lives of our personal heroes, and in the leadings of our own hearts. We are a church more interested in integration than separation, in acceptance rather than judgment. We believe in the core value of equality. All of us are created equal and have equal value and rights around the world. We value the duality of reason and intuition, science and faith, body and spirit. Unitarian Universalist religious beliefs are not focused on how to earn one's way into heaven, but on how to honor our connection with the present day earth and all beings with whom we share it. We want to bring justice, compassion, peace, and understanding to all here on this earth. So whoever you are and wherever you come from, you are welcome here. Sometimes I'm asked why we have six sources in addition to the seven principles. And if you are new here, you can find those principles and sources in the first pages of the hymn book. In one way, the second part of the answer to the question of just what is a Unitarian anyway, the principles, the way we try to guide ourselves, that's one answer. The principles lay out that path for living well, but the sources add another layer, another texture. In the tradition of theological debate, it is not enough to say what you believe. You also have to lay out for the scholars why you believe it. Otherwise, we could all potentially run around calling ourselves God, and that would be confusing. We need some base on which to construct the structure of belief, maybe even some evidence of some kind. Christians, for example, follow the Bible, often augmented by the teaching doctrines of their own denomination. Jews do something very similar, though supported by Midrash. The Buddhists follow the Five Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Muslims follow the Quran, supported by the Haditha. So the commission that crafted these principles and sources 30 years ago asked themselves that question as well. In what do we root these ideas? From what sources do they spring? How do we justify naming these particular views as being important to us? Why do Unitarian Universalists believe what they choose to believe? And since we are such a diverse group, as well as an ever-evolving group, they came up with several sources, five originally, including all the world religious traditions, the rationalism that marks humanism, and so on. And I will note that in that ever-evolving category, that the sixth source the one honoring spiritual teachings of earth-centered religions was only added a decade after the first five. But how did we get there? Why that list? For that, we have to wander a bit through our philosophical history. And by the way, this is a little taste of a course that I'll be offering later this fall, looking at some key documents from our history and our philosophy and the evolution of both. The one can trace the roots of Unitarianism, meaning one and only one God, and Universalism, meaning all will be saved, 
back to the very first days of Christianity, really our story begins in the 16th century with the Reformation. Don't get scared, this is quick. Back then there was only one game in Europe, the Roman Catholicism. But enough people became annoyed with the incredible physical excesses of the Pope and the Cardinals and the Bishops and the constant demand for money that a revolution began. But in part, the revolution was also one of ideas. Hitherto it was a case of believe what the church tells you, follow the rules or else we will tell you what's important for you to know in the Bible. Ah, the good old days for clerics. But with the rapid development of the printing press and the spread of relatively inexpensive editions of the Bible, clerics and scholars began doing something quite new, reading the text for themselves. And they found that they had some pretty strong disagreements with Rome over interpretation and emphasis. And so a revolt of ideas accompanied this revolt of excess. Now, whenever a revolution begins, some people want to go this far, and some want to go this far, and some want to take it all the way to the end. And the people who would become the Unitarians and the Universalists in time were hanging out on this far edge of the Radical Reformation. No surprise. Now, first, the scholars who were now reading Scripture for themselves wanted to start to apply reason to the study of the Bible. They saw that parts of it were contradictory. They saw portrayals of God throughout the Scriptures were completely inconsistent. And too much of doctrine seemed to be based on magical thinking. Choices of scriptural passages used for worship were selective and often taken completely out of context, chosen to support teachings rather than being allowed to speak for themselves. So the rational scholars wanted their beliefs to make sense. They wanted to look at why they were supposed to believe in something and not just take it on faith anymore. So reason was the first piece of this emerging liberal religious vision. The second piece developed from the first. A very early thinker in the Reformation, actually even starting a few years before the Reformation, was a guy named Miguel Servet, Michael Servetus, a Spanish theologian and physician, who in reading the Bible for himself discovered quite correctly that there is not one single mention or allusion to the idea of a holy trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's simply not there. But the trinity is a fundamental belief enshrined in the Christian creed and in all their teachings. So how could that be if it's not in the Bible? His criticism was scathing. But even for reformers of the time, this was way, way too big a step. This, this, this was overthrowing mom and dad. This was just not okay. So not only did the Catholics condemn Servetus' book, but so did most of the Protestants as well. Now, there were a lot of pretty radical reformers back in those days, but Servetus ended up standing out in history. Why? Because he was burned at the stake in 1553. And curiously, he wasn't killed by the Catholic Inquisition. They condemned him to death, but kind of allowed him to escape. He was executed under the orders of his fellow reformer, John Calvin, in Geneva. So this would touch off what was called the toleration debates. And this is really Servetus' important piece of history. It touched off these toleration debates that would rage across Europe for decades, even a century. And at the simplest, it was a bunch of very nervous Protestant reformers saying, hey, if they could burn that guy, what's to stop them coming after me? And so they suddenly began to say, maybe we should share ideas in a more peaceful fashion. And they began to argue for religious tolerance. Now, it took time. It took a long time. But one by one, European nations, starting of all places with Transylvania, came to allow more than one religion to exist legally in their nation. 
So tolerance became the second piece of the story. And it led naturally to our third key piece, which was freedom. Now what freedom came to mean in our congregations was freedom to believe as individuals, not to have belief imposed upon you. The Unitarian and Universalist churches that formed in the 18th and 19th centuries in England, the United States, and Canada never had creeds, but they were still pretty uniform in their thinking and their believing. It didn't look a whole lot different from the Christian churches down the street. In 1819, however, William Ellery Channing of Boston preached a sermon to his colleagues, one that lit a fire. It was called Unitarian Christianity. And the sermon is still very readable today, and you can find it easily online by typing in Unitarian Christianity. Be warned, however, back then sermons were routinely an hour and a half. <laughs> Aren't you lucky? <laughs> he said, we object to the doctrine of the Trinity that subverts, in effect, the unity of God. Okay, that's going back to Servetus a couple hundred years before, but it's there. He would argue that the idea of Trinity, again, contradicted Scripture, but also that it diminished the concept of God. And then he continued, we believe that Christ is one mind, one being. And I add, a being distinct from the one God. That Christ is not one God, not the same as being with the Father. Channing all but dismissed the divinity of Jesus in that sermon, arguing that his message and his story and his death were far more inspiring if he was of one mind, i.e. fully human, and not divine or semi-divine. Then he said, We believe that all virtue has its foundation in the moral nature of the human being. That is, the conscience, the sense of duty, and in the power of forming our temper and life according to that conscience. We believe that these moral faculties are the grounds of responsibility and the highest distinctions of human nature. We reject the doctrine of irresistible divine influence on the human mind, molding it into goodness as marble is hewn from a statue. There it is. As we are free to form our beliefs, we are free from divine intervention and manipulation. We are our own agents. We are responsible for our lives. We are responsible for our lives and our choices and therefore have responsibility to make those choices carefully. The devil did not make me do it. Many of us today might think his sermon pretty ho-hum, but in refusing to accept these most basic principles of Christianity, Channing started us down a road of a creedless religious freedom. And there we see a more recognizable form of the faith that we have today. We rule ourselves, and we decide the nature of our relationship with God and many other theological prints. We make those decisions for ourselves. This humanist sermon of Channing's also opened the doors for us to look at other religions and other philosophies. For Unitarians now had the freedom to seek without intellectual or doctrinal limit, to seek out ideas beyond Christianity. It opened up the box to free thought. Now, Channing's younger contemporary, Ralph Waldo Emerson, would soon introduce the U.S. mainstream to Buddhist and Hindu thought. And in the next few decades, scholars would argue about the need to consider the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Gospels as completely separate and not naturally flowing one into the other. They also began to look at Scripture as a more literary work, opening whole new avenues of understanding and interpretation. How was it written? For whom was it written? When was it written? Who actually wrote it? And this exploded thought and interpretation. With Channing and his colleagues, freedom of belief became enshrined in our tradition. So now, let's jump ahead to the 1980s when we're working on our principles and purposes. The North American 
movement was doing that work at the time. And as part of the process, the Commission looked at the things that inspired our individual beliefs. With our freedom, reason, and tolerance, Unitarians have been able to look for meaningful ideas regardless of their source. And with surveys and such, it became clear that we looked at many different religious and philosophical expressions in forming our own. Following a strong burst of humanism developed following World War I, our church became very intellectually focused for a time, and there was less emphasis on spiritual practice and prayer. That would shift again later. But as these shifts back and forth took place, some spiritual remnant remained alive. And so when we look at the sources, we see nods to traditional belief systems, with perhaps special note given to Jewish and Christian traditions, because that is where the structure of our organization came from. But we do see humanism and science given very special attention as well. And with a resurgence and rediscovery of paganism and native traditions, we would come to see the need to add earth-based teachings as well. All of these things influence our collective thinking and our individual thinking to different degrees. It's a good list of sources, one that many people seem to be able to accept. But there's one source that forms a unique statement in theological thought, and that's the first one. It's first because it has pride of place and speaks more about who we are than any other phrase in the principles and sources. Direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which removes us to a renewal of spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Why do I think this is the most important passage? Because it says that the primary source of your faith is you. Your life. Your experience. Your reaction to things. Everything else acts on you. But it starts in here. It's your experience that determines your belief. Your spirituality. Your morality. Preachers may influence and help you define your views. Teachers might point out weaknesses in your arguments. Religious teachings might offer you some bases to touch in your thinking. But at the end of all of that, it is your experience of the world, your experience of life, your experience of those mysteries and of the spirituality that surrounds you. That's what counts. No one gets to tell you how to practice your beliefs. The principles can guide. The sources can offer insight. Congregations like this one can be safe havens, lending encouragement for the search. But you are the primary source. Your religion begins and ends with you. And that, to me, is the great gift of Unitarian Universalism. That respect, that affirmation. You are enough. Amen. One of our great religious educators, Sophia Lyon Fawes, offers us these words for meditation. It matters what we believe. Some beliefs are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. Some beliefs are like shadows, clouding children's days with fears of unknown calamities. Other beliefs are like sunshine, blessing the children with warmth and happiness. Some beliefs are divisive, separating the saved from the unsaved, friends from enemies. Other beliefs are bonds in a world community where sincere differences beautify the pattern. Some beliefs are like blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. Other beliefs are like gateways, opening wide vistas of exploration. Some beliefs are rigid, like the body of death, impotent in a changing world. And other beliefs are pliable, like a young sapling, ever growing with the upward thrust of life.